Hi, I'm Robin from Rainbow Gardens and today we are here with Karen Gardner. She is a master gardener and she is doing a class for us today on uh, fall into winter gardening. And this is one of her squash that, that she grew herself. Isn't this amazing? September gets a little cooler, it's usually a little bit rainier, then we get into October and we can continue planting cool weather crops. We can be doing our beets, our, our carrots, you know, cauliflower, broccoli, start getting our greens, lettuces. Spinach seeds tend to like to sprout when the weather's cooler and they're a little finicky sometimes. But Texas, we grow gobs of spinach in Texas, so Texas it's a great state for growing spinach. You just have to be a little patient, wait for the weather to cool off a little bit, and the seeds will sprout better for you. You'll get better germination. Um, another thing to plant is garlic. And it's best to get actual garlic that is intended for planting. I grow garlic every year. I haven't always been able to find it locally. I've ordered it before online. And I have grown it from the supermarket before, but when you're growing the stuff from the supermarket, it's not, it's not necessarily guaranteed to be disease-free, so you might be bringing pathogens in. Um, so that's another thing that do you want to take into consideration. Um, when I do plant it from the store, I, I soak it in baking soda and, and fish emulsion if I have it. Um, overnight soften the shells and then I peel them. The baking soda is supposed to get rid of the mold that might be on it. Um, and, and then I usually dip it in hydrogen peroxide. I've heard people say dip it in vodka, but I don't drink, so I never have vodka at my house. <laughs> um, but if you can get the, it's best to get the garlic that is intended to be planted because they've been growing it, they've inspected it. It's, it's for planting, it's nice big bulbs. To plant. Um, when you're planting the garlic, also find the biggest bulbs and plant those. Don't plant the itty bitty ones. You're just going to get this itty bitty plant and it's not going to do all that well. But you plant your garlic, you let it grow during the late fall, during the fall, let it get to plant. In the winter time when the weather's cold, it might just kind of slow down and look like it's doing nothing. Um, but it'll get going again in the spring and then it'll start forming bulbs and then you'll plant it and you'll form, you'll pull up the bulbs in the late spring. And, and the tops will start dying down. You'll, you'll see, oh yeah, the tops are dying down. It's time to dig them up and harvest my garlic. Um, and I used to think, why grow garlic? Because it's so cheap at the supermarket, but it's just fun and it's really fresh. And I like a good, strong garlic. Um, the elephant garlic, you can grow that as well. It's kind of fun. It's not as strong though. It's not a true garlic and it, I don't like the flavor as much. But I, I grew elephant garlic years ago and I don't know how it does it, but I think I've pulled it up every year and somehow I've missed one or two cloves and it just comes up every year for me. I just keep having it. Um, and onions, you can, if you're planting from seed, start those. The 1015 onions, it's 1015 because October 15th is the traditional day to be planting it down in the valley. Um, so that's why they're called 1015 onions. So if you're starting from seed, start your onion seed in October. If you're starting the transplants, you can wait and plant them as soon as the nurseries get them in, which is usually like mid-November, December. They usually have them in stock November, December, January. And I don't really like to plant much after the end of January on my onions. Um, I have done so. Um, but, but I like to get started a little bit bigger, get some nice big green tops going before we have really cold weather. And the more leaves you have, the more rings you'll have. So every leaf is a ring. So you want nice leaves on your onions. Um, cilantro, <laughs> cilantro is wonderful stuff. Unfortunately, it doesn't grow in the warm weather. It grows over the winter time. Um, and the first time I planted cilantro, I just went to the grocery store and bought coriander seed. Coriander is cilantro seed. I don't know why we call it two different names, but 
It's called coriander when it's the seed and it's cilantro when it's the herb, the green thing. And I just, I just got some coriander seed and I just planted it. I didn't even, I just threw it out. <laughs> and every year it comes back. I just have cilantro that grows wild all over everything. Um, and, and it's wonderful, you mow your lawn and you're mowing this cilantro, it smells great. You know, I never have, um, so I, I can't really answer that question well. I, and it's something, that's one of the new things I ought to try. I ought to research and try that, because I haven't really used those in my cooking much. Um, you, I, I've planted leeks and, and done that. Leeks are a little more, um, you can continuously plant leeks. They seem to do withstand the hot weather a little bit better. Um, your onions, when the weather gets hot, they'll start bolting and, and sending up a flower stem and you'll want to go ahead and harvest them. What about um, onion sets, the green and white? Yes, yes. The, the little plants? Well, they're just a bulb and you take off the skin and then you set them in the ground. I don't plant them that way. They don't do as well and you don't get as big of a thing. Get, get the, little, the little transplants. They'll come in a bunch of about 60 of them. It's like three dollars for like 60 <laughs> little plants and they're just they're about this tall they they have them in boxes when when they come in there will be a box and it's just what they've done is they've started growing them from seed Dixondale Farms down south in Carrizo Springs they they grow all of these transplants for places all over the country and and so when usually when you get them from the nursery you're getting them from Texas Carrizo Springs area um, and, and what they do is they start them as seeds and then they dig them all up and they'll be about this tall they'll, they'll cut the tall tops off and, and you'll just get a bunch of them and they look like this almost dead little mass of plants you know they're still a little bit green sometimes they're a little brown around the edges and stuff and you stick them in the ground and it's amazing how quickly they rejuvenate and start growing Oh, depth on onions. You don't want to plant them deeply, a half inch or so. Um, when I have those, what I do a lot of times with those little transplants, I'll take them home and I'll actually put them, I'll, I'll get a tray, like just a nine by 13 baking pan, and I'll put paper towels in the bottom. And then I'll dampen the paper towels and I'll set all those little onion sets on them and I'll get the roots to rejuvenate because when they've dug them up, they've cut off a lot of the roots. So you'll have some little roots, but I'll, I'll do that and I'll dampen them and get those roots growing a little bit before I put them in the ground. So I'll, I'll bring those things home. I'll, I'll take the rubber band off of them. I'll spread them all out. I'll put them in the pan. I don't keep lots of water in that pan because they'll start rotting out from the bottom if it's just sitting in water. But I have the paper towels or you could just use an old rag or something and just kind of keep it slightly damp. And, and then I like the roots to start growing a little bit. That way when I plant them, I plant, I, I make a hole and I put the roots down in there. And then, and then the little white part at the bottom where the bulb is gonna form, that just barely goes into the ground. But the roots are down in the ground holding them in place. Otherwise, if you, if you just get them Either that or you can plant them a little bit deeper initially. And then I, I've heard people doing this. They plant them deeper initially and then as they start to bulb, they pull the soil away. That's a little more work than I want to do though. <laughs> when did you say you plant the sets? What time of year? I, I usually like to get mine in in December. And it kind of depends. Um, sometimes I just get busy. Sometimes we go out of town for Christmas. Um, so it kind of depends on the schedule. The latest I would want to get them in would be mid-January. And, and like I said, I usually pre-root them a little bit in a pan. And, and that's an easy thing to do. It doesn't take a lot of water to do that. And, and you can, in a nine by 13 pan, you can get pretty much that whole set. You can get about 60 little plants in that pan. Let them go for a week or two until you get some nice little roots on them and then plant them. That's what I like to do. Uh, when does potato eyes come? Okay, potatoes. 
Generally, we plant the potatoes in the spring, early spring. And so, um, I have not ever seen them available in the nurseries in the fall. And so, it's, you could try. There are some things that I try. Um, I have grown potatoes in the fall, but it's a real iffy proposition. <laughs> um, and when I've grown them in the fall, I've had to use um, potatoes from, from the store, which I don't prefer to do. The seed potatoes do better. And, and they're certified disease-free and that kind of thing, whereas the stuff from the grocery store is not. But I have, I have done them, and, but I've had better success with the certified seed potatoes. Um, another thing that I've grown in the fall that isn't really recommended is sugar snap peas. Um, their, their recommended window is January 1st through February 15th. And I have grown them. I might try them this year because we've been having a milder year. Um, but it's not something that I go out and say, yes, do this, you're going to have great success. It's like, you can try it if you want and maybe it'll succeed and maybe it won't. Um, so, so there's that. Transplanting those uh, seeds, the onions from seeds. So are you doing it directly in the ground? Or you no. So you're doing everything in a pot pretty much first. At first, she was asking about planting the onion seeds. When I plant onion seeds, what I do is I get um, a tray that doesn't have cells. So uh, years ago, I helped with my kids' enchilada dinner at the school, and I, when they were done, they had all these aluminum pans that they had the rice in, and I grabbed them all, <laughs> and I've been using them for years and years and years for various things. But I, I'll, I'll just put some potting soil in there, some very fine potting soil. I'll strain it through a screen and, and get very fine seed starting soil. You can just buy bags of seed starting soil as well. And I'll, I'll do that. And then I'll put my onion seeds on there. They're very small, little tiny black things. And then I'll just sprinkle, just like you could get a little um, sieve, like a little strainer thing, and just sprinkle soil on top of it. So just barely cover them. And I let them grow in there for a while. And you'll get green sprouts growing up. Um, and then you can transplant those. So if you're growing them from seed, it's really easier just to buy the, the seeds. If you, the reason I've grown them from seeds is just because I like to try different varieties that maybe the nurseries won't have. When you go to look at the Dixondale website, the Dixondale website has a lot of onion growing information. Um, and they'll, they have certain ones um, that will, so they have about five different kinds for our area. And in San Antonio, we grow what are called short day onions. So the onion bulbing is triggered by day length. If you, if you try to grow long day onions here, you won't get the bulbing right. It has to be short day onion varieties. So I've grown some from seed before because I just wanted to try other ones, but I always check if you're buying seed or if you're buying the starts, they always have the right ones. I have gone, I have seen long day onion starts in May at, at, at some of the big box stores. <laughs> I'm like, no, <laughs> it's not the right time to plant them. It's not the right plant. Um, so it's, it's really important we really are different than a lot of the North. When I first moved here, we didn't have internet yet. Um, and I would go to the library, I would check out library books, and most of the books were about gardening up North somewhere. So if you're gardening here, if you're looking up books, find books that talk about Texas gardening. And if you can find things South Texas gardening specifically, like I said, when you're doing an internet search, put TAMU there or put Bear County look through the sources that are provided by the Bear County Extension for your information. Look for reputable research-based sources. As master gardeners, we try to present information that's research-based. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll say, this is what I've done in my garden, and this has worked for me. But um, generally, if I'm experimenting with something, and I don't know if it's gonna work, I'll tell you. <laughs> You know, like, yeah, the sugar snap peas, it's not really recommended to plant them this time of year. I might try it, but I may, it may be a failure.
and that's okay. I, I will, you know, try a few seeds just to see. I'm, I'm going to experiment. But if you look at those, look for reputable sites. And when you're looking at YouTube videos, um, another thing that I oftentimes enter in a search is EDU. Because a lot of times I'll get university-based research. And every, every state has a land-grant university. And they do, those universities do a lot of research in plants, horticultural research. And they're, they're generally good, good sources of information. Not, you know, let's dance under the moon and spin around three times and our plants will grow, <laughs> okay? It's good research-based information. Okay, so those are the main things in October. And, and of course, like I said, the winter stuff. Um, December and November, November and December. Harvest and enjoy. Have some stuff for your Thanksgiving dinner from your garden. And I continue planting things. I'll continue planting beets and um, carrots and I'll just keep it going. When I plant the things in November and December, January can get cold. If I have things in the ground that I haven't harvested, I may need to protect them. We do have occasional freezes. If it's a light freeze, what the pattern here in San Antonio oftentimes is we'll be getting a cold front. It'll start blowing in during the day. We'll get those cold, cold north winds. It'll start blowing in during the day. The sun will keep it sort of warm during the day. But then at night it gets colder and colder and colder. And usually our freezes happen right before dawn. So it won't be freezing until like 6 o'clock in the morning. And then it'll freeze from 6 to 8. We'll get two hours of freeze. If it's just a slight dip below freezing, your lettuce, your broccoli, your spinach, your beets, your carrots, they're not going to be phased. It won't even bother them. The things that bother the plants is if we have an unusually warm fall and then suddenly we get really cold weather when they haven't been had a chance to kind of become acclimated, then you want to protect your plants in that case. If it's been warm, 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 warm and then suddenly cold, go ahead and cover things. Um, or if it's going to be cold for an extended period of time. So when we had our snow vid, it was, it was, was freezing for several days. And then about midweek we had it, it got up to like 45 one day, and then we had more cold weather and more snow. So we got a little bit of a reprieve in the, in the middle. But in a situation like that where you're going to have many hours of cold weather, or it's going to dip well below freezing, so I would say below, you know, 28, 25, that range. If it's going to dip below there, then pre protect your plants. But your cool weather crops, if you're planting the cool weather crops, the ones that will do well in the cold weather, then they're not going to need as much protection. I have, I have grown tomatoes and kept my tomatoes growing until um, Christmas Eve. A couple of years ago, I had them at Christmas Eve, and then I just decided to pull them up because we were going to be leaving. Um, but I protected them. I covered them up. And so you'll, you'll need to do that if you're going to be doing that. Um, the last thing for November and December, start planning for spring. Start dreaming about your spring garden. Um, and then the last thing here are some helpful links. David Rodriguez did a couple of really good um, presentations. With COVID going on, he's been, the Extension Agency has been doing um, online presentations. It's just um, Skype, Zoom kind of meetings. And, and they've put a couple of these on YouTube. And I, I gave you links here at the bottom to two of them. One of them is 12 months of vegetable gardening. Excellent presentation. And he just goes through month by month. January, February, you can grow these things. A really good presentation. Um, and growing a fall and winter vegetable garden with David Rodriguez. That's an, those are both on YouTube. Um, they're about an hour and a half long. If you don't want to sit for an hour and a half, then put the speed at 1.5. <laughs> um, and, and underneath, he put links of what they're discussing at which point in the video. Um, so those are, those are a couple of really good presentations. And then there are, um, there's a link here, spring garden links and fall gardening links. Those are the things I mentioned earlier about what to plant and when to plant them and the varieties that do well in San Antonio. So that's, the, that's our presentation, but if you have questions, you're 
welcome to ask questions. And if you need to leave, I won't be offended if you get up and leave. <laughs> you talked about potting up, so getting small plants and putting them in just a slightly bigger pot. Yes. Keeping them kind of protected. A couple of weeks is long enough. Yeah. yeah. What? One thing that a lot of us tend to do, I'm guilty of this, I, I come to the nursery and I'm like, I want that and I want that and I want that and I want that. And do I have the ground prepared at home to put them in the garden yet? Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> and so I'll end up with plants that, that can't go into the yard, garden yet because I haven't prepared it. I haven't, you know, done, added the compost that I want to add or the fertilizer or whatever and I just get busy. And so it's easy to put them up in a slightly bigger pot. So this one, I would, that's what a two inch pot, two and a half inch pot. It could go up just barely bigger. So you could take it into something this size. It doesn't have to be a whole lot bigger. In fact, the tomatoes do better if you just go a little bit bigger. Um, with these, I had this, in a pot like this initially, and then it was like that, and then it, I put it into this one. Another thing, if you put it into a pot that's way bigger all of a sudden, so if I went from this six pack size straight up into here, I'm just wasting a lot of potting soil and a lot of water. It's gonna take more water to water this size. Um, and, and the roots won't have gone and filled this pot if, if I did that, when I transplanted this one, the roots are still gonna be smaller and most of that potting soil is just gonna fall off. And if I want the potting soil, yeah, to add to my garden soil, I guess fine, but usually potting soil is a little more expensive so you can save a little bit by just potting up just a little bit. Is it going out saying that you're gonna rotate your crops from spring to fall? Even yes. Like you would year to year? Very, very good question. She asked about rotating crops. Don't grow the same thing in the same place year after year after year. Um, bugs will, will be living there. They'll lay their eggs in that area and they'll be ready for the next crop. Oh yay, tomatoes are growing here. <laughs> let's, let's just stay here because we know they're gonna grow tomatoes here again. So if you're rotating them, you'll have less pest problems and soil. Um, your soil gets depleted. There are some crops that just are heavy feeders. They need more nutrients um, and they'll deplete the soil more. So if you're rotating, you'll end up with less of that. But of course, use fertilizer. <laughs> Don't be like I did. My, when I started actually really using fertilizer regularly, my plants did way better. And they did okay before. And I didn't really know there was a problem until I saw that they were doing better. So. I would say incorporate it in the top six inches. You could put it deeper if you're able, but I, I would say just the six inches because it's gonna take a while for your roots to get down if you put it too deep. They're gonna, you know, they're not gonna be there yet. And it's just sitting there maybe getting washed down deeper into the soil as the rains come. Do you use it makes it granular and then you do like some of the liquid? Yeah, I kind of, I kind of mix it up. Yeah, and like I said, it's, it's just read the label, read the label. And on the pesticides, read the label. I, I asked them to bring these out. We didn't talk about this, but these are my three favorites. These are all organic. I don't, I don't like to use harsh chemicals. I, don't, I like to use the organic. The Thuricide is a BT product, Bacillus thuringiensis. This is for the caterpillars. So this is for your, um, your cabbage loopers. So for your broccoli, your cauliflower, your cabbage. It also does well, some of your greens will get the caterpillars on them. Don't spray this on your butterfly bush. <laughs> you know, don't kill the monarchs. You don't want to get those. Just spray it in your vegetable garden on, on the cabbage family plants primarily and some of your leafy greens. Um, this I have found to be really successful. I've had a lot of problems in the past with thrips on my pepper plants. And I just spray this regularly. The way I like, this is the insecticidal soap. And the way I like to use this is I'll spray it 
either in the evening or very early in the morning. And then I generally wash it off if the sun is gonna be really hot on the leaves because it can damage the leaves. My preference is to spray it in the evening, let it sit overnight. It, it just coats whatever insects are there. You really wanna get good coverage. And usually it's for the thrips, mites and aphids. You wanna get them covered. And then in the morning I'll go rinse it off because I don't really want the soap to stay on the leaves during the day. And then the other one I use very rarely. Um, it's spinosad. It's, it kills whatever eats it. So it, it will kill the things that are munching on your leaves, on the leaves. Spinosad. I've also heard it pronounced spinosad, but I don't know. If they eat the leaves after you spray it, it has to be ingested. This one you don't need to spray off later. But <laughs> the, um, this will kill honeybees. This will kill honeybees if it's wet. So you don't want to spray this when there are bees around. Spray this late at night, let the bees go to bed. Spray it at night, let it dry overnight, and then it'll be fine. But that's, one, that's the reason I don't overuse it. I only use it when things have gotten really bad and, and I'm desperate. Okay. Are those the same bees that also are pollinating? Yes. So the honeybees that are going around pollinating your plants and stuff, you don't want to kill them. I don't use it on my squash plants. I don't use this on my squash plants, especially when they're in bloom. You might be able to use this um, on the stems to help with the s uh, squash vine borers, um, but I, I don't use this when there are bees present and I don't spray the blossoms. Your cucumber beetles might get into your blossoms and stuff, but I don't spray the blossoms with this because it can kill the bees. More questions. So you said rainwater is good for plants. Mm -hmm. Somebody told me once that you should not wet your, your foliage with your hose. You should plant. So is that the difference between whatever is coming out of your faucet versus the you should, you should, in general, you should not wet the leaves of your plants, period, with anything, if you can avoid it. Do they get wet with rain? Of course they do. Um, and, and there are some times, the, I think it was the University of Florida did some research a while back about misting pepper plants in the afternoon when it's really hot and cooling them down, and that actually helped. Um, but as a general rule, don't, don't, you don't want the leaves to be wet. Moist, wet, th moist, warm things are perfect petri dishes for bacteria and fungi. I want to back up just a little bit. We were talking about uh, biologic uh, bug control. I, I didn't want to forget about uh, ladybugs. Oh, the ladybugs. The ladybugs work so great on your uh, squash and your cucumbers when they start to get some aphids. They do. The ladybugs, and, and in the late winter, when your broccoli plants are starting to, to get kind of wilty, you'll see aphids all over them. And then if you just wait a couple of days, you'll see ladybugs. And go look up what a ladybug larva looks like. How many of you know what a ladybug larva looks like? The people that work here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we have a video about that, Joel? I think so. I think we have it on some of our YouTube yeah, uh, videos. Yeah, ladybugs. Uh -huh. Yeah, the ladybug larva is not round and cute. It's kind of long and, and thin, and it looks like something that you don't want on your plant. Orange and black. It's orange and black, and it looks like, oh my goodness, I need to kill this thing. It's probably hurting my plants. No, the ladybug larvae eat more of the aphids than the adults do. So go home and look up what a ladybug larva looks like and don't kill it. <laughs> let it. Let it thrive in your garden. Another thing that I've used as well is the beneficial nematodes. <clears throat> and, and I've had success. I've noticed that when I've been using the beneficial nematodes, I haven't had as much problem with the leaf-footed bugs. The beneficial nematodes are in the ground and they parasitize things that are overwintering in the ground. The pupa that are overwintering in the ground and they'll, they'll kill them. Another thing is um, the beneficial wasps. 
there you'll see if, if you look up um, caterpillar if you do a search and just look up something like caterpillar and beneficial wasps they'll they'll lay eggs on the caterpillars you know the big um, tomato worms tomato hornworms they'll parasitize them and you'll see the hornworm and you'll see all these little white things sticking out of it. it looks scary it's like this little monster those are the wa the wasps the wasp babies they're they're eating the caterpillar from the inside out <laughs>